Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Francesca Coyne and I'm a senior lecturer at Lancaster Sociology and I am absolutely delighted tonight to host this wonderful event with a very, very special guest, Professor Emerita Silvia Federici. Uh, before I outline the event and introduce Silvia, let me just say that we've been supported in bringing together this event by Dr. Michael Lambert, who's doing and has been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, alongside our wonderful colleagues, Alison Hui and Idris Kandi, who will be working behind the screen tonight. So thank you. Um, and my partner in crime in the organization of this event is our wonderful colleague, distinguished professor Beth Skaggs, who's also the director at the Center for Alternatives to Social and Economic Inequality at Lancaster University, and who will also say a few words to welcome Sylvia. Over to you, Bev. Thank you, Fran. I just want to say an absolute warm welcome to Sylvia, who has been so important to so many of us for such a long time. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to be able to host her and are very grateful for the time that she's taken to speak to us. I really cannot uh, overemphasize the significance of Sylvia to our activism and to our analysis. And Fran's going to say a little bit more than that, but I also want to say, I hope this feels like a special treat to our students who've been studying Sylvia's work, and I hope they'll come up with some very good questions. So back to you, Fran. Thank you, Bev. And before we begin, I thought I'd give you a sense of why we decided to host this event, because this event is part of an MA module that Bev and I co-convene called Capitalism and Crisis. It is a module that we inherited from Professor Bob Jessup and that we teach as part of the MA program in sociology at Lancaster University. And Sylvia has been a daily point of reference in our discussion and in fact, she has been an inspiration for many of us, both staff and students in the department for many years. And it is hard to do justice to Sylvia's work in the space of an introduction. Actually, it's probably impossible. But more humbly, what I'd like to say is that her relentless sense of justice, her untainable quest for truth and trust in solidarity have revolutionized theory and practice. And I wanted to mention the two books that we've discussed today in our MA program, her groundbreaking book, Caliban and the Witch, and her 1975 book, uh, Wages Against Housework, uh, that is also associated with the campaign that we also discussed today, Wages, the Wages for Housework campaign, and that unveiled the importance of, of women unpaid labor in the process of capitalist accumulation. And these two books alone show how Sylvia's work has reframed our understanding of capitalism as not an abstract process, but a process of accumulation that takes place on our bodies and has also created a method that combines theory and practice, turning activism into a process of theoretical production, a collective process of theoretical production and theory into activism. And for us, this is also a daily reminder of why we do this work, despite the fact that it's getting harder every day, because what we learn from Sylvia is that theory cannot be separated from action and that we can use this work to speak the truth and to work for a process of social transformation. Uh, tonight's lecture is entitled COVID-19 Capitalism and the Crisis of Social Reproduction because these are topics that have been dear to Sylvia for a long time. In fact, the current pandemic and the global resonance had global resonance also because it touched also rich countries such as Europe and the United States. Uh, but all over the world, the world, there has been a sequel of epidemics from Ebola to SARS to the avian flu in the past decades, bring to light a crisis of social reproduction that has been unfolding for decades. And it is for all these reasons that we're honored and very grateful that Sylvia could be with us tonight. 
Sylvia's talk will last for about an hour and then we will have an hour of Q&A's. Uh, you might type your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during our discussion. So thank you again, Sylvia, for joining us. We're delighted to have you here and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Francesca, and thank you, Bev Staggs, and uh, uh, all that have collaborated to make this event possible. I'm very, very happy to be here with you. You know, one of the ways to break down the lockdown and the isolation has been actually the ability to connect with people in different parts of the world through Zooming, webinar, and uh, as much as I've had resistance towards the digital technologies, but nevertheless, this has been an important, it's been an important tool. Um, you know, so schematically, because uh, I think that to go to the roots of uh, this crisis, this uh, in the form of an epidemic, uh, really require a rethinking of the last 50 years, if not the last 500 years, of capitalism. But certainly uh, COVID, the pandemic, uh, is uh, demonstrated to be, first of all, a political and social crisis as much as a public health crisis. And uh, I want to start tonight to say that um, it has revealed to us in a way uh, that is uh, in, impossible to evade, you know, the degree to which this society, in a way, um, does not guarantee our life, seems to have no interest in, you know, our reproduction, and, uh, and in fact, you know, in, uh, puts us in a state of permanent crisis. The COVID epidemic and all the people who have died because of it, and the people are now, we are told, for many years, you know, not only uh, suffering because of the loss, but also suffering those who have been affected by the virus, you know, by the damages it has done to their system. All of this could have been easily prevented. There is no question and I think uh, that evidence can prove that, that this epidemic could have been uh, anticipated. Uh, it is the result of many very conscious decisions they were taking to defund, to defund all the services, all the means of reproduction that are essential for our life. And one reason why it could have been prevented is because, first of all, starting with the early 1980s, starting with the early 1980s, we have seen, and uh, Francesca Coyne has mentioned it already, we have seen the hands in hands with the restructuring of the global economy, with the world expansion of capitalist relation and particularly a new advance of capitalist relation in the former colonial world, what is usually referred to as the global south. You know, we have seen uh, the onset of uh, a whole succession you know, of epidemics in Africa, Latin America, parts of Asia, you know, we have seen uh, epidemics all through the 80s and 90s in many African countries of cholera, meningitis, and of course, Ebola, an epidemic of Zika, and on and on. Um, and what has also become clear, you know, during this period is that this epidemic were a direct result of economic and social policies that were taken at the international level by international agencies such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and they were in a way a consequence of a whole political program that can only be described 
as a program of recolonization of the so-called third world, a program of recolonization in that essential part of the restructuring of the global economy that begins in the late 1970s, clearly to a great extent in response to the decades of anti-colonial struggle and to the fact that to some degree this anti-colonial struggle has succeeded you know, in shifting the power relation, in shifting the international power relation. And the restructuring of the global economy has to be seen in that context as a sort of a counter move, counter revolution. And uh, in fact, all the elements of it, the debt crisis, structural adjustment, you know, they all combine to reinstitute all the major mechanisms and policies that were typical of the colonial period. And uh, we have seen, for instance, as part of the structural adjustment program, which the IMF and World Bank have imposed on many, many countries throughout Africa and then Latin America and beyond, in the name of economic recovery, recovery from the debt crisis, which had been very much artificially engineered. We have seen an imposition of massive austerity program, forcing government to defund all the most basic services, healthcare, education, um, basic necessity, public transport, uh, investment into medical, you know, medical products. And we have also seen a policy that has, uh, you know, led to major social dislocation and uh, the uh, expulsion from the land of thousands of thousands of people. You know, uh, the shift from uh, communal land ownership to individual titling, the green light, you know, given to major corporation to go to country and install, you know, extractivist program, mining, petroleum, the very extractivist program that have fueled the digital economy. We have seen massive impoverishment due in part to the systematic devaluation of local currencies. I mean, in some country, you went from one to one, a dollar with, for example, the Nigeria Naira, to one to a thousand. Mm. Massive unemployment. So, as a result of this situation, you no, know, as a result of this situation, over the period of a decade, you really see a transformation, you know, not only in social relation, but also in people ability, in people ability to reproduce themselves. The epidemics were not due simply to, you know, the larger social circulation, economic circulation of goods and so forth, but they were due to the fact that people's immunity system were being destroyed. They were due to the fact that malnutrition has become rampant in large areas of the world to the fact that sanitary systems have been completely defunded. And I want to say something here. I understand that um, many of the people who are listening to my presentation have been reading Caliban and the Witch and discussing also the question of witch hunting, you know, and its role in the history of capitalist development. Well, what we saw in the 80s and 90s in particular, and continuing into the present, continuing to the present, the one of the results you know, of the spreading of epidemics, for example, throughout Africa, and one of the results you know, of the spreading of mass impoverishment, dislocation, and so forth, has been a return of witch hunting. In other words, that hand in hand 
with the processes that I have described, there's been a return, you know, of uh, a, a persecution. Again, focusing primarily on women, a focusing primarily on women who have been accused of causing the mortality, a mortality that too many people that was uh, escalating and too many people appeared to have mysterious reason. Because suddenly, in the space of a number of years, you know, people are dying and people are dying of uh, all kinds of new diseases, all kinds of new epidemics. And uh, immediately, the idea that these deaths are not natural, but they are due, you know, to the fact that someone is actually plotting against you, right, has begun to circulate. And has begun to circulate in a context, and I want to say a few words here because I think this is important to understand, to only begin to understand some of the social development that are taking place now in so many parts of the world. Because hand in hand with impoverishment, hand in hand with increased mortality, with the spreading of epidemics, you also have a situation of many populations who are seeing the means of their own reproduction vanish. They are seeing new social inequality, social inequality deepening. And they also are confronted daily with situation that is becoming more difficult for them to understand because the decision that are affecting their lives are taken thousands and thousands of miles away. They are not due to a local despot, but they are due to decisions that are made in Chicago, in London. So their life becomes mysterious. The forces that are governing our lives, that are shaping whether we can live or we can die, whether there will be, so to speak, food on the table or not, these decisions are now you know, more and more, you know, removed from the places where people who are affected by them, affected in very vital way, you know, uh, inhabit. So this is the situation that has been created. And one reason that is given for this return of which aren't has also been that due to the structural adjustment program, the imposition of these severe austerity budgets, you know, less and less people have been able to go to clinics or they've been able to go to doctors. And there's been a revival of people who, which what we call uh, traditional healers, who in many cases, in front of the inability to deal with the situation, inability to understand and respond to this crisis and to the diseases that right, have you know, resorted to charges of witchcraft. So I want to bring in at the very moment, at the very beginning of my presentation also, the deep connection between on one side, the mortality that's been created uh, by economic policies, by social transformation, uh, connected with the expansion of capitalist relation and at the same time new forms of violence, new forms of division, of social division are uh, taking place because this pattern is a pattern that we see now expanding due to COVID worldwide. But the point I want to draw from what I've presented so far is to say that we have seen this process unfolding all through the 80s and 90s, and always in a crescendo. Therefore, it could have been anticipated that particularly, you know, with the global exchange of good commodities and, uh, you know, uh, different forms of trade and the movements of people, the like epidemics would not remain confined, you know, to places of Africa or Asia. 
this could have been predicted. However, contrary to what one would expect, or at least what one would expect, you know, if you trusted our government and institution to actually care for our reproduction. But contrary to what could have been expected, we have seen a systematic defunding, and this I'll say it's also global, investing in the United States and uh, many parts of Europe, you know, of all the most important infrastructure, you know, related to our reproductive work and our reproductive health. For instance, and I'm speaking now of the United States, you know, from all through the 90s into the present, you know, budget for public health care has been cut. Budget for a nursing home, for elderly people, those who are not self-sufficient or have Alzheimer's and do not have, you know, the means, do not have the resources to go to private clinics or to assisted homes and have to resort on the publicly funded nursing home. We have seen the funding cut, decimated, so that, for instance, we have had reports upon reports over the years, right, of uh, really dramatic conditions prevailing in the nursing home, also with cases of abuse by a staff that has been continuously reduced and therefore in many ways, you know, driven to level of exasperation that often has resulted in abuse. Uh, we have seen also that, uh, you know, hospitals, for instance, in New York, you know, have been continuously shut down because they were not sufficiently profitable. Hospitals, I'm speaking of publicly funded, those to where low income people will go. In the last 20 years, 19 hospitals in New York have been defunded, right? Um, we have seen that daycare services, every service that uh, has been important for the reproduction of life, you know, has been curtailed. So what the COVID epidemic has brought to the surface it's a major, major crisis. It's not created a crisis. It has dramatized it. It has intensified it, but it has not created. And in fact, what we've seen with COVID, you know, we have seen, in fact, you know, confronted us, you know, with a situation that had been denounced by many social uh, health workers, organizations, many social justice movements. You no, know, a situation of clearly unsustainability, you know, at all levels. Uh, the mortality, the hundreds of thousands of people have died in the US and across the world, they did not have to die. Clearly, they did not have to die. I'm going to concentrate in the US because I think it's very important. The evidence that comes from here is especially important because the United States is considered the richest country in the world. It's considered oh, the American dream. And not only that, this is a country who controls trade in large part of the world, whose companies have in fact, you know, been able to appropriate resources have been able to institute no form of a colonial expropriation in many, many parts of the world. So when in this country people are dying because of the lack of governmental institutional investment in their reproduction is particularly significant because these deaths cannot be justified, cannot be explained on the basis of lack of resources, on the basis of underdevelopment. They can only be explained on the basis of a systematic decision that has been made at the highest level, corporate and governmental, at the highest level, as to what is going to be invested in. 
And what has become clear is that the well-being of the population is by no means a priority. Not only is not a priority, but is something that has been confined over and over and over, you know, to the to the last concern of institutional planning. And you know, I'm going to in uh, the second part of my of my discussion to understand what are the the broader implications, what are the broader reasons for it. But I want to stay uh, for a while on this question. You cannot explain. You cannot explain why, for instance, in a country like the United States, for months and months, hospitals were not able to cope, you know, with a sudden increase of hospitalization. We have seen nurses in the first weeks of the pandemic, even in New York State, using a time plastic bag because everything was missing in terms of protective equipment. We have seen after 19 hospitals were closed in New York, we have seen beds placed into barracks. We have heard complaint and desperation from nurses and doctors about the lack of the most basic, basic equipment. And we heard also about much about pre-existing condition. Pre-existing condition. What has been the pre-existing condition? Pre-existing condition include, for example, damaged lungs, damaged lungs like you have in parts of the United States, in New York, areas of New York where the mortality has been very, very high, the Bronx, Queens, places that have been notoriously very contaminated, where the air has been so bad over the years, the children are born with asthma or develop asthma very early. Obesity, obesity that comes, that has escalated over the last three decades, because more and more people, for lack of time, lack of money, are relying on food that is absolutely terrible for their reproductive system. You know, fast food, greasy, etc., etc. So obesity as a pre-existing condition. These are all very preventable conditions and can only be explained on the basis, actually, of a whole deterioration and degradation of the process of reproduction that we have witnessed now over the years as this new restructuring of the global economy, what we call the neoliberal phase of capitalism, as in fact, you know, increased enormously the amount of work that people need to reproduce themselves and at the same time curtail the resources with which we can do that. And uh, at the center of the crisis, as we know, has been uh, women uh, in the United States. 3,000 between doctors and nurses have died because of the COVID. Many of these deaths, of course, would have been preventable, but women have been really at the center bearing the brunt of this situation. And maybe we can explore this more, you know, in the discussion period. But they burn the brunt because on one side, they have, you know, been forced to work in terrible conditions in the hospital, but also, on the other hand, have been forced to take on a tremendous amount of work and housework and telework, you know, once they were, uh, had been able to work inside the home. For those who were not forced to work outside the home, but would work inside, have also are rich situations that are unsustainable because the amount of hours of work between children, telework, domestic work, etc., has been uh, exposed. Uh, but in this case, too, it exposed a crisis that was already to a great extent existing before and now has been intensified. So, having said this, the next question is. Why? What does it mean? Why this is happening? 
and what are the prospects, you know, for the future, right? Um, now, I think that this is important because we, everybody senses that uh, this is a turning point, you know, that um, the COVID pandemic, it's really a moment we don't, we don't understand yet all its implication for the future. But I think there is a profound awareness that this pandemic represents an important turning point, not only from the point of view of healthcare, but from the point of view social, political, institutional, you know, politics. And, uh, and in fact, we have been told that this is the case. I don't know if you have seen, for example, the latest uh, communiques from the World uh, Economic Forum. Uh, the World Economic Forum now is speaking of the Great Reset. They are speaking about the Great Reset of the uh, capitalist economy, how the COVID the pandemic is setting the stage for the whole rethinking by a whole rethinking of the capitalist economy. And uh, believe me, I've done some work trying to understand what, what they have in mind. <laughs> trying to understand. They, they give three ways in which, you know, the capitalist, the international capitalist class, three ways that it has in mind, you know, in terms of the reset. And uh, it's, they're not completely clear but what they have in mind is a restructuring of the conditions of work, a restructuring of world production that obviously places um, much more power into the hands of government and particularly corporation and at all levels seem to push in the direction of a major centralization you know, of economic operation, of a major coordination, of the type of coordination that only large company, large corporation can organize. In other words, in the very nebulous, cloudy words of the World Economic Forum, what capitalism is prospecting now, and, um, you know, Naomi Klein, of course, was right when she spoke about shock therapy, the fact that you shock people, you scare people, you know, you have people at the verge of death and this in a way enables you, these are the kind of situation that enables you to make social changes that would otherwise be unacceptable and even unimaginable. And I think that we have to be very concerned about the fact that the COVID pandemic is now giving, you know, what we call the world government in terms of international capitalist organization and corporation, is giving them, in a sense, a, providing a situation in which they can implement program, plans, policies that may not have been uh, acceptable in, in, in the past, but because of the fear that people have incorporated and because of the level of increased isolation, the kind of because of the lockdown now becomes possible or will be attempted. It's very interesting, for instance, uh, to see that uh, we are now told uh, that this epidemic will, is here to stay with us that uh, we'll probably have to vaccinate every year because this epidemic will remain. That is possible. The new epidemics will also occur in the future. Very little has been said about, for example, therapies or preventive care. Uh, actually, now everything is vaccine, which we know is a major, 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 you know, uh, speculative operation. And I don't want to say that people should not be vaccinated, but certainly they were speaking about billions and billions that are being made by the pharmaceutical companies, you know, through the vaccination. And, uh, and we are told that this situation is not momentary, 
but in a way is going to be here with us to stay. Uh, we also see that uh, enormous amount of money will be now used to create new form of infrastructure and many people will welcome them because the argument is that this is relaunching the economy in a situation in which there is a widespread desperation because many cannot even pay the rent for their home, have lost employment, don't see a hope for the future. And but this restructuring, what kind of restructuring is going to take place? And uh, I think that looking ahead, we can particularly look in at the future uh, from a point of view, you know, of past history and from a women's point of view. I think that we can anticipate a type of capitalist development, a new phase of capitalist development in which more and more the kind of program forms of production that will be placed, put into place, will be forms of production that will confirm the kind of isolation that has been imposed on many workers, you know, in the name of uh, the pandemic. For example, already we hear many employers who are speaking of the fact that they have learned, you know, through these months, they have learned that not all the operations they have set up in the past have to be done you know, in their premises. The much of the work that has been relocated on a home basis will continue to be located on a home basis. And that this may apply in particular to women, because in this way, women will be able also to absorb more of the work of reproduction that um, is, you know, is, is, uh, is necessary. Now, that said, what, what are the deeper reasons that are driving these movements? What are the reasons that are driving? Here may be speculation, but what is certain is for seven decades now, uh, for many years now, you know, the capitalist class has been complaining of insufficient you know, profit rates, which is not in a contradiction you know, with the fact that some companies, Amazon in particular, you know, have uh, made fabulous earnings, fabulous rates of profit. But it seems that the average rate of profit of capitalist investment has not been. And uh, I refer here to the fact that for some years now, uh, in many parts of the world, growth rate has declined or been close to zero, to the fact that the interest on the dollar has also been at the level of zero, has not increased, which means that there's been a reluctance of em employers, of uh, uh, producers to invest into forms of production that apparently were not guaranteeing the level of profit that they would expect. In other words, one way to understand some of the modifications, some of the changes that the international capitalist class will introduce, uh, will make operational, you know, taking advantage of the crisis opened by COVID, taking advantage of this crisis, right, may become more clear if we connect them, if we begin to connect it, you know, with some of the sense of malaise, the discontent that has been visible at the highest level of capitalist planning for a number of years, having to do with the reluctance of investment and with the sense that, you know, um, capitalism 
was operating much too much into a battlefield, right? And I think here is important that we look, you know, at the global scenario for the last decades. We see that across the world, uh, there is a battlefield. Across the world, we have seen, you know, population uh, are, are up in arms in many, many ways because of uh, the refusal of the levels of exploitation, refusal of the level of immiseration that is continuously imposed on them. No, we see it in India, for instance. What is happening in India is, is quite fantastic, but it's not only in India. It's happening, in fact, uh, the fact that in so many parts of the world, you know, we have forms of micro warfare mm, and uh, we have movements that are at each point struggling against deforestation, against the destruction of cropland by mining and other forms of extractivism, you know, against the destruction of urban spaces. Mm. So, uh, one response, clearly, it is for capitalism at this point to set in motion new forms of development, new forms of production that in a way can undermine this kind of protest this kind of widespread refusal, the spread of social movements. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, using the lesson and the situation created by the COVID, right, to impose new forms of organizational work, the further isolate people, the further, you know, uh, make us, uh, plan or organize our life on a very individualistic level. You know? So I think that this is the prospect. You know, this is what is uh, you know, uh, ahead of us. And uh, I think uh, it's very important to see you know, how, what has been the response to this, what is possible to respond to this. You know? uh, I have to say, first of all, that the question of violence is very central here because uh, over the years, you know, as part of the rise of um, the expansion of capitalist relations, we have seen a surge of violence at all levels, but in particular against women, uh, because women have been in the forefront, have been in the front line you know, of the struggle to defend the environment to defend, uh, for example, land from expropriation, you know, to prevent the coming into, uh, you know, a, an area, a region of a mining company, gold mine, that poison the cropland, poison the waters, or are coming to do logging, destroying forests. And it's not an accident that women have been in the forefront because women are those who are much more responsible than any other group in society for the reproduction of their families. And they know the long-term consequences of the destruction of the natural wealth. And because of that, we have also witnessed a surge of violence against women. Not only the violence due to the lockdown, which has increased 40%, 40%, right? But also the violence that is related, you know, the more public violence that is related to the fact that, uh, you know, women are involved in all kinds of movements that are now clashing directly, you know, with the corporation that are now basically consuming. Uh, I've been thinking about Thomas Moore in the 16th century was saying that the sheep are eating men. Well, now we have the gold mines and uh, the other extractivist operation were eating entire population, 
pushing them off, pushing them off the ancestral land. And in many cases, it's the women who are the ones organizing against it, right? So what to do in this situation? It seems to me that, uh, you know, it's very important that the first and uh, most strategic a uh, type of uh, engagement in which we can, uh, you know, place ourselves is the kind of struggle that forces, that addresses all the ways in which in this society, you know, we are being separated, we are being divided, we are being pitted against each other. I mean, COVID has been really a godsend in a way from the viewpoint of isolating people. If corporations are afraid of uh, mass mobilizations, right, mass protests, COVID has certainly been a godsend. You know, the capitalist religion that others are a threat that we have to always look at other people, not as a source of wealth, not as a source of enrichment, right, but as a threat to our well-being in a kind of competitive state, you know, where our well-being, you know, and their well-being and others are not compatible. Some have to die for us to be, for some of us to prosper, yeah, this very perverse logic, which is asserted and enacted in so many different ways. Uh, COVID, right, has been a good promoter of it. Because in a way, now everybody looks at the other with suspicious. Are we going to be contaminated? Of course, we have big counter tendency. Mutual aid, people coming together, people protesting, refusing, refusing. We have seen it in the United States in the great mobilizations, you know, against uh, police brutality. But nevertheless, nevertheless, you know, uh, it has taken it all. It has taken it all. Therefore, one of the most important steps that we must take, whatever political program, whatever demand, protest, first of all, the question of recognizing that throughout the history of capitalism, capitalist society has been able to reproduce itself by dividing people, by creating hierarchy, the paid, the unpaid, the colonized, those recognized as citizen, those not recognized as citizen, the immigrant, the undocumented, the colonialized, etc. Uh, also, it is very important that we begin a process of restructuring of the way in which we organize our reproduction. And by the way, I want to say, um, adding to the question of division. Uh, now in the United States, we say the one of the pre-existing conditions for COVID, for the mortality of COVID, one of the pre-existing conditions has been racism uh, because you know, we, uh, it's become clear that um, according to statistics, even in the black community, even people who have a considerable level of income. They do have a life expectancy lower, significantly lower to the life expectancy of white people in the same income bracket. Because clearly the tension of dealing with living in a racist society, for example, the tension produced knowing that if your child goes into the street. Every time your child goes into the street, that child may not come back, may be out of the most futile encounter with the police being killed, right? That, that creates a tension that destroys our bodies. And in fact, this is a theme that has to be explored and repeated. The tension that people live with on a day-to-day -day basis, today in this society, because of our work, because of unsanitary condition of work, 
because in order to make it to the end of the month, you have to take on a lot of debt. In the United States, students leave the university with a huge amount of debt. They will follow them all through their life. Women who have jobs outside their home, the majority of working class women, the income they make are so poor. And then, of course, going to work costs money that they have to fall into that at a very high interest rate because they don't have any collateral. So they go to payday companies, payday loan companies who give them some money at very high interest rate. All of this, all of this creates tension that are killing us. All of these are pre-existing conditions. Living in a society that is built on social injustice is a profound pre-existing condition. We don't have to look at the state of our arteries or the state of our kidneys or the state of our eyes in order to understand what our chances of survive in order to be able, in case we get COVID, right? All of this to say that you know, we need a systemic social change. The what COVID has demonstrated hmm, has not created a crisis of social reproduction. It has dramatized it, and it has also demonstrated that unless we address the COVID pandemic, address the crisis presently open, right, uh, in a way that addresses the systemic causes that addresses not the emergency, not the immediacy. Mutual aid is very important. Everything that deals with the immediacy, with the urgency is very important. But then what we need is a systemic change. And a systemic change in order to occur you know, necessitates, first of all, really a profound change in the way, in the organization of our reproduction, in the social fabric of our everyday life, right? We can discuss this more because I mean, I see now that my time is, is uh, diminishing. Uh, we can discuss more. I've been using a lot the notion of the commons, rebuilding the commons, uh, reproductive commons, right? creating forms of reproduction that are more cooperative, that are more collaborative, that, uh, you know, produce profound ties, affective ties, social ties, and therefore also forms of security, solidarity. All of this, however, all of this in function to not only to make our life livable, you know, to overcome the sense of fear, paralysis, self-devaluation, and regain confidence in our capacity to transform the world, but also functional to have more power in the negotiations or confrontation with the state, with the government, with the corporation. More power that I think we need to really uh, force a re-channeling, a re-channeling of the social wealth. When we speak about an anti-capitalist struggle, this is what we're speaking about. This is what we're speaking about. We're speaking about creation of another society where the devaluation of our life, the devaluation of our life is not a systemic element of the logic that governs the system, where we don't have a, a, a system and it's like governed by a logic you know, that systematically devalues our reproduction, cuts the fund, cuts the social wealth at the service of our reproduction. And I think we have to be very, very concerned that the turning point, the great reset, the great reset that the, great, the World Economic Forum is talking about is in that direction. That every great moment of transformation in capitalist society, every great moment of crisis which capitalism has used to restructure itself, right? restructure itself always means 
cutting the dead branches, eliminating those uh, type of business trade that are not any longer functional to the process of accumulation. This is what we are talking about, the reset, right? Those great moments of capitalist transformation. They generally always begin with expelling more people, you know, from uh, their lands, their jobs, their pension system. And uh, I'm afraid that we, that is in the cards. I'm afraid that is in the cards, right? But a restructuring, right, that in a way creates more concentrated forms of control, more concentrated forms of capitalist production, right, more integrated, right? And uh, so in that way, I think it's extremely important, it's more important than ever that, uh, you know, at the opposite level, we also um, uh, in, uh, increase, intensify right, the forms of collaboration that we have with each other and intensify the restructuring of our daily reproduction you know, in a way that enable us to pull together our strengths put together the resources and uh, transform our communities, our homes, our families from places where we reproduce ourselves as worker, where we reproduce the workforce of the future into communities of resistance, into places where we actually reproduce new forms of struggle. And, uh, and this, I think, is the task of the moment. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia, so much for your talk. Uh, that uh, you gave us a picture of what's been happening in the past few months and of how even uh, this idea of the, cri the crisis of social production has been has escalated into something even more dramatic. Um, we've been receiving lots of questions for you yeah. and I'll, um, I'll, I'll ho I hope we'll make it to go through as many as possible but I'll start yeah. from the last one that has arrived which is uh, thank you first of all for this talk. Uh, I was wondering how terms like community care and sisterhood might unfold under such circumstances. In other words, what might community care entail and what might sisterhood mean in this context? Right. Can we have maybe two or three questions? Yes. So let me move from the bottom up. Uh, we have um, a question from Julia that asks you about um, the visibility uh, of essential work and essential workers and the clear exploitation of the body of these workers, if you can say something more about yeah. this. And, and one, and then we go three, three. And so. there's another one um, from Sophia. Um, as we said, she writes, from the 80s and 90s, there's been a restructuring of the world economy and with it a new witch hunting. What kind of forms is the witch hunting, is witch hunting taking nowadays? Are there different forms in the global south and in the global north? And can you anticipate how women will be affected with the new restructuring? Right, OK. I'll start from the last and I go back to the first and uh, yeah the the new forms of witch hunting the the novelty is that in this case unlike the witch hunts of the 16th 17th century um, it is not the state it's not the state you know that is launching the persecution which was certainly the case There'll be bills, laws passed, and then a persecution would follow. Now the persecutions appear to happen from below. Uh, usually 
It's um, groups of people, could be neighbors, sometimes family members, right, who are accusing particular individuals, uh, again, 90% women, of having caused the death of a relative, very often having caused the death of a child. Uh, and, uh, but one thing that has been happening uh, also in Africa is that more and more children have also been accused, not only women, many children have been accused of being witches. And uh, often they are not killed, unlike the women who are being killed, uh, but they are subjected to all kinds of tortures in the name of being exorcised, being exorcised. So the accusation are using the whole traditional idea, you know, of the devil. And uh, those who are affected are mostly older women, Many, many cases has to do with land. Women who inherit land today in a number of African countries have to worry. They have to worry because uh, if they inherit land, very chances are that they might be accused, you know, by family and neighbor. But so the, the, the perpetrators often appear people who are close to these women, to the victims. But actually, it turns out that in the background, there is all kinds of uh, complicities by local chief, in, in complicity with companies who are trying to dispossess people of land and who are interested in sowing suspicions in a process of massive land expropriation, land privatization. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a more compl it's a complicated, so in a few words, but we are talking about the fact that, and on this there's a lot of agreement, we are talking about the fact that the kind of economic and social developments that have taken place in many regions of the world, over the last three, four decades, have created such social tensions and competition for resources in communities that there is now a, a perverse logic in that competition for resources. For example, elderly mm, are seen uh, with suspicion or are seen as an unnecessary burden on the community. Uh, there's obviously a link with the fact that most of the women were accused of being witches, you know, are women who are old, often living alone, and generally is when they have some access to land, some access to resources that others are interested. So, there is a very clear link between these witch hunts and uh, and and of course they would, the the way uh, it affects women is terrible because particularly you know the poorest women the oldest women those who are more vulnerable right are at tremendous risk and often they are you know killed very cruelly think for instance that now in the north of Ghana there are camps which is camps where women who have been uh, threatened with that, you know, are um, taking shelter, are taking refuge, right? And uh, I, I read recently that uh, what is beginning to happen is that after menopausal age, after a certain age, some women don't even wait to be indicted as witches. They are actually moving. They are actually moving to these camps for safety because they are afraid of being a burden, of being treated as a burden. Uh, oh, I see. I, um, so this is about the witch hunt and then maybe we can go into, into more detail. I've written actually an article on the new witch hunts 
in uh, across the world in uh, in one of my latest book called Witch Hunting Witches and Women. And maybe you can look at that. Uh, in terms of uh, the essential workers, this is a really a very, very, very important issue. Most of the essential workers, nurses, you know, are in the United States migrant women, right? Who for many years before the COVID epidemic have been denouncing the condition of their work because particularly in the public hospitals, everything is being defunded. And you know, among nurses too, there is a, a hierarchy because you have the chief nurses who often work close to the doctor, and then you have the aides. And is above all the nurses' aides, they do most of the work, and they're usually the ones who are less paid, terrible work hours, um, they have a large number of patients to care for. The number of patients has constantly increased. Over the years, we have seen a lot of protests by nurses saying that 10 years ago, you know, in a moment, in a morning, they have five or six or seven. Now they may have 20. And if accident take place, for example, the wrong medicine is given, you know, something goes wrong. They are the one who take the blame. They are the one who take the blame. So the institution can get away with the defunding by pitting the nurses against the patient, pitting the nurses against the families. The hospital administration will tell the family, oh, you know, things went wrong, it's those nurses. They come from the Philippines. They don't know enough, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have our standards. So this kind of built-in racism has also been functional to enforcing labor conditions that are really inhuman. And now with the COVID, imagine these women going home with the fear of carrying the infection to their families and what it does to their bodies what it does to their body, not only the proximity with so many people dying, but to see all these people, to see all this pain. You know, we have heard so many stories of nurses who are devastated psychologically. They are devastated emotionally, not only exhausted by the constant hours of work and the fear of bringing the disease at home, but also from this constant, many times they are the only ones who assist, who witness the death of a person as the families are not allowed. You know? So it's terrible. Now, you know, uh, during the first six, seven months of the epidemic, you know, every night at seven, people open the window here and they you know, clap the hand uh, and, you know, there were all these signs, yeah, we are heroic, you are heroic. That's very nice, but it's not enough. That's very nice, but it's not enough. We need a movement who changes the condition of these women, who changes the condition of nursing, who makes nursing at any point, not only during the COVID epidemic, right? not an activity that you have to pay for with your life. And, uh, you know, to say you are essential workers is very good, but has to be back up with policies that are changing the material condition of the life of these women. And also of the men, because they are also male, you know, nurses aid. And I want to add only this, that um, we have seen in recent years from Occupy and other situations that nurses, you know, as a whole have been among the, like teachers, mostly female teachers, have been some of the most conscious and politicized people in the working class. That um, very, very often 
in the case of mass mobilization, the nurses have been there, you know, to basically uh, say, you know, we are here, we want to make sure that people are safe and want to sure to see what is that we can contribute. And uh, we have a great debt of gratitude to them. Now, what we can do, what we can do at women as, uh, and I mean women in the broadest sense of the word, right, in terms of community care. You know, I mentioned before, I think that the feminist movement for too long has uh, underrated the question of domestic work, the political importance of reproductive work, domestic work, and has concentrated much of its effort, much of its ideology, and its organizing around winning different and better condition in the wage workplace, and also breaking into male-dominated sectors. And this may be unnecessary, but as we said over and over and over for years, we, myself and other women, interested uh, organizing around the issue of reproduction. Unless in this society we settle the question of reproduction, particularly as women, not only as women, but particularly as women, we cannot negotiate better conditions no matter where we go. Because the experience now of three decades of 70% of women having waged employment had shown very clearly that you don't leave the home, right? First of all, you go and take jobs outside the home that are really extension in the majority of cases of housework. Precarious, poorly paid, and paid housework in many cases. Secondly, you know, it means that you're adding that work to the domestic work. You go back home and you work in the weekend, you work in the night, you work early in the morning before you go to work. Right? So the two situations, the question of reproduction and the question of the other activities in which we are engaged ourselves are very profoundly connected. We cannot think they just going out. Only very select number of women can do that. Those who can hire other women. Those who can hire other women. Those who can go out to work and they can have a babysitter, they can have a maid, they can have a live in, etc., etc. Because somebody has to do their work. Because they are children, they are elderly, they are people with chronic diseases, parents who are aging, yeah, and uh, all their work way is going to be done, right? So what we have seen is that despite the fact that so many women, you know, since the 1980s have taken jobs outside the home, the government has def defunded all the social services, you know, has defunded, publicly funded childcare, publicly funded senior center, publicly funded nursing home, completely defunded. So now you have working outside the home, earning a meager wage, you still have to go on some work, and then you have to pay this money to care for your children as well as the transport, etc. This is an untenable situation and is a scandal that after so many years of feminism, we are still at this stage. And I repeat it over and over, you know, COVID has shown it. Now every woman is screaming because those who are back home, they have to do the telework, they have to do taking care of the kids, helping them with the internet, helping them with the trauma of being away from their friends, right? Then doing the, so many women are exploding now. In the United States, 5 million women have left paid job in the last year. 5 million. 2 million 500. These are the statistics. 
have left it spontaneously. Spontaneously means they had to leave it because they didn't know where to place the children once the school were closed. Once the daycare were closed, they had to stay home. So I think that the, 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 to go back to the issue, the fact that we cannot resolve, we cannot really transform our life as women and the society, and the society, unless we also deal, you know, with this fundamental question of the devaluation of reproductive work, which is the devaluation of our life, which is the logic of this system. Unless we address that, that we live in a society that systematically places our reproduction on the bottom. So that when we look at the future, now we look at the future, what do we see, right? I fear that this money, for instance, that the Biden government is giving us, you know, immediate subsidies, immediate a little support, which leaves many people out, mostly immigrants, right? But the, this money, they will make us pay for it, right? Maybe by reducing pension, reducing unemployment subsidies. Mm. My, my, my most dire prediction is that we are moving towards a, a situation, you know, where more and more the work of reproduction will be thrown again completely on our shoulder or much larger quotas of the work, right, will be in fact thrown back into the community, into the families and uh, most likely the shoulders of women. So I think that women have to organize. And I think that, uh, you know, you begin to organize by working at the community level, right? Community care, for example, signifies, you know, beginning to connect women in the community with women working in the hospital women in the community with women working in the schools, beginning to create common spaces, common grounds, because we need each other. We need those who are in the home and those who are in the institution and begin to see how we can change some of the infrastructures of care, how we can organize con together to put pressure on the institution. And, and if we demand services, what kind of services we want? We need to have a voice in the services that we want. We need to have ways of having some control. For example, if we demand daycare centers or centers for the senior people who are not self-sufficient, we need to be able to control what happens there, right? This is the direction in which I see the struggle. But uh, fundamentally is to place the issue of reproduction at the center. Even if we struggle on the question of wage work, etc. But not to forget that all of that, if reproduction is the foundation of every other work activity, and it's the foundation of our life. That's where we need to start. OK, so Sylvia, I'll collate some uh, questions now. Sure. And I, I think you keep you are addressing them as um, I, I'm putting them together. But Katie asks, um, are we in a state of disaster capitalism or do you have any hope for increased solidarities? And that's quite similar to Theodorus's question, which he, he asks if um, social reproduction is becoming so much more difficult, um, how is capital gaining so much legitimation and consensus? 
um, how are the forces keeping people docile? And I wonder, uh, in response to that, are they keeping people yeah, no. docile? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You know, what we're seeing is American cities on fire. Yes. What, what I'd like to add into this is because we've seen such a destruction of the welfare states in welfare state countries, uh, in countries that had welfare states, do you think we should look to places that have organised without welfare states, places like India, where you've seen phenomenal feminist uh, organising, are they going to offer us a better model for solidarity than, say, looking to the, the global north, which is basically, as you show, being completely devastated in terms of welfare provision? Um, it's OK, maybe all, all right, three. Um, First of all, disaster capitalism, you know, to me, capitalism is a disaster period. It's not disaster capitalism. I mean, that, of course, capitalism goes through different, but um, I think that, of course, there are moments, if we look, if we take a look at the history of capitalist society, right, it's very clear that there are moments, the moments that are most, uh, uh, disastrous are those when the system sees itself in danger, when the system is subject to level of contestation. I think the 60s and 70s, for instance, were such moment. And that the restructuring of the global economy, which I call a counter-revolution, right? That the process of globalization dismantling the industrial system in Europe, the United States, relocating it, you know, in a maquila type of system, sweatshop type of system across the world, you know, through processes of recolonization, et cetera, et cetera. These are all responses of a system when it sees itself in danger and it has to consolidate its foundation. So I'm suggesting that in a way the COVID epidemic is providing an opportunity for a system that for some time already has been hinting that they are going through a crisis and is providing the opportunity to make structural changes that inevitably in their program, as we can see them, uh, are transforming the power relationship you know, to the advantage of capital. They are giving corporation, government more power. They are you know, further reducing the amount of investment in the collective reproduction. Um, so, in this sense, it's a disaster capitalism. It's a capitalism that sees itself in need to restructure by, for example, eliminating a lot of small business. There's huge amount of small business that will never reopen. There's a lot of small outfit. We are going to see more and more the big corporation, the big chains, down with the small pharmacy, down with the small shop. And we see more and more. So there's a concentration of capital. This has been like the main road of capitalism, right? They have some tools, land expropriation, decommunalizing social relation, and uh, you know, this this process of concentrating power, wealth, controlling system, etc. So in that sense, yes, but it doesn't mean that we are powerless. It doesn't mean that nothing can be done, right? So yeah, a red flag, danger. <laughs> we are in danger, right? And we've been in danger for quite some time, you know? But for instance, and I, I think it's very important, I meant to say before, 
we are not given the mortality rates, the mortality number from cancer, which is more than COVID, from suicide in the United States. We now have between 40,000 and 50,000 suicides. Now, mostly young people, also the elderly, but mostly now the increase is among young people, right, who clearly see no future for in, in front of them, right? Uh, and even the increase of shootouts. I mean, this is a society that is self-destructive. When you have a society where you have 154 mass shootouts, there is something very wrong in that society. Something very wrong in that society. And and um, so I think there is a, a you know the the second question said why the consensus. I don't think there is a great consensus. I don't think there's a great consensus. I think there is a very generalized unhappiness. There is clearly a very generalized unhappiness, you know, which the COVID epidemic has turned to desperation, has turned to desperation. Uh, and I think that, you know, the levels of repression has also increased and of control. The, organization of control, surveillance and repression is very, very, very high. But uh, I do not believe that actually people are acceptance. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is a very general knowledge among a lot of people internationally. Now that this system is a predatory system. It's a system that continuously destroys communities. We have not even talked about war. Look at what has been happening in terms of warfare. The United States is coming away from Afghanistan, 20 years in which the society has been destroyed. Syria, endless war, right? And behind this war, you see that there are obviously very clear economic interests having to do with oil, petroleum, mining, control of trade routes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, it's a very desperate society. And, um, but I also think that we need to look at the other side, which is, you know, all the powerful social movements that have been growing and to see how those social movements connect how they connect, how we establish common grounds. I think this is the one of the tasks that is ahead of us. The issue of welfare. I don't think we should put welfare or no welfare. You know, it's like reform of revolution. I don't think we should have those alternatives. I think we should ask what forms of welfare you know, for instance, in the United States in the 1960s, you know, there was a big struggle that was mostly led by black women because they were the most organized, because they had behind them the experience of the civil rights movement, the black power movement, and uh, they fought to change this governmental program that was called Welfare Aid to Families with Dependent Children. It was a program that assigned a subsidies, you know, to people, family, mostly the women who had a child, they were too young for them to go to work outside the home and you could receive a certain amount of money so that you, you would not be forced to rush out of the home with a young child, no partner, and take another job. Right? This small amount of money for many women was the alternative, you know, to, to it was a lifeline. And uh, many of us said this is a very good program that actually helps all women. It gives all women 
the possibility to decide. You know, do I stay with my child or do I also want to go work outside, etc. But it does not, it prevents us from having to go out no matter what and take on the first job that comes along, right? Just because we are desperate for some money. So that was a good program, but unfortunately it was cut. And I have to say the feminist movement did not come out strongly as they come out for abortion in support of this of this program, right? So I think that welfare, I mean, reforms are not to be rejected immediately. The question is, what kind of reform? Because all too often, and this is the danger of reform, they satisfy certain needs, they satisfy certain parts of the population, leave others behind, and they break the struggle, right? In other words, very often, you know, what we call a reform, that maybe you gain something, it means some people gain something, right? And uh, that means that, you know, the struggles, the solidarity is weakened. Uh, so I think that the question is, we need a mass discussion, you know, in, in, in the movement, you know, what is, we need to change the condition of our reproduction. In the 70s, we launched a Wages for Household campaign. It was never meant to be a revolution. It was meant to demonstrate certain things and to change the power relation between women and capital. It was meant to open up a different kind of struggle. Right? But today the, the issue is still open. We want social services, great. What kind of social services? You know, and who decides about wh what they are, what we get? Um, we want monetary assistance, right? In what forms? I think there has to be a debate. And of course, there cannot be a solution that fits all situations. But certainly, whatever we demand has to lift the bottom, has to be the kind of change that does not only satisfy, you know, white women or middle class or this or that in a way that in fact breaks up the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, creating a common ground. More questions? Yes, we have more questions. I'm collating uh, up to uh, four that are very similar. There's two questions about uh, women and pregnancy, and one is asking, uh, some are being pushed to take experimental vaccines, even though the uh, potential outcomes are unknown, and can these be viewed as uh, physical or psychological violence against women. And one related to this is um, uh, there's comprehensive fear about be women being used as biofactories of vaccine after they've found antibodies in breast milk of huh. breastfeeding women after vaccination. And there's there's two more that are very similar that I'd collate into one if you agree they're both about alternatives and Lydia's asking about the strange known death of neoliberalism once again neoliberalism isn't died even though society is overwhelmingly surrounded by death do you see the possibility of counter movements and that's the same as Islam al Khatib is asking do you see transnational activism unfolding from the global south to the global north yeah I'll start from this one you know well I think uh, that there's been a lot of transnational movements and I think we need to study them and understand uh, how to actually you know uh, in make them more powerful and uh, how to make those connections stronger 
but I'm thinking of the environmental ecological movement. And I'm thinking in terms of feminism in the recent years, the call for the women's strike. And of course, we all know, for instance, that uh, when you speak of women's strike and when you speak of strikes that are dealing specifically with production, we are speaking of something very different from a union strike. Right? Very, very different. First of all, because in many cases, you know, the, the person involved cannot cross their hand and stop doing the work if uh, you know, they have to care for people who will suffer from that. But the strike has enabled, because it has been a global call, you know, launched by women in Argentina in 2016 and then 2018, right? It has begun to make all kinds of connections between women in different situations. It has enabled a whole set of exchanges and conversation, transnational conversation, that I think have been very important. The kind of internationalism that we celebrate of International Women's Day, but often remains a dead letter, you know, has actually come alive in a way that I had not seen in quite some time because of that. And has become a conversation, which means what do we need to do? What striking or calling for a strike has made us learn? There is a beautiful, beautiful book by Veronica Gago. It's one of the women in Argentina who connected with, working with uh, Niuna Menos. And she has published a book, which in English is called Feminism International. And I suggest that this is a book to read because uh, she really speaks what the, the, the strike has meant, the call for the strike at all levels. What, what have we learned because of that call to strike? You know, the kind of new internationalism that has been generated. There is one example, but not the only one. I think ecological movement have begun to connect internationally. And uh, that is the direction. Capitalism organizes internationally. We have to do the same. Obviously, you know, and, and the other things that we have known for a long time, the concept of the global, the global, right? Our local is profoundly affected by things that are happening globally. Mm. I was mentioning before that if you are a, a coffee grower, you know, in Kenya or in Uganda, you know, and life becomes mysterious because the price of your coffee, how you can sell it, at what price, the condition of cultivation, you know, are affected by, you know, decision taken in Chicago. So we need to have that international connection. That is really very, very, very important, right? And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's already beginning to happen. Now, the question of women's biofactory, oh my God, I didn't know this. I didn't know the story of the... <laughs> Every time it seems uh, you learn something. Uh, well, I'm... Not surprised, women's body has been mined. We have seen extractivist, you know, extractivism as a principle of capitalist expansion, you know, with the mining, with the oil drilling, but also the women's body. They have mined the women's body, taking out the eggs, right? Uh, taking out the placenta, you know, placenta has been used in so many ways. And, uh, you know, now I would not be surprised that women, the wealth of women's body, capitalism is known it. You know, I've written time ago that women's body is the last frontier that capitalism has tried to, to cross, to reach, right? And uh, 
because it is so productive. No, it is so productive. It's so much organized for the production of life. And so it is really a great object of desire. And uh, the vaccine, you know, yeah, of course, if you are forced to experiment vaccines, mm, some people are saying that actually all the vaccines that we have now are a great experimentation on our, on our body. And I don't know. All I know is that we will not be able probably very soon to do much unless we are vaccinated. Because uh, more and more places are placing the vaccine as a condition. Right. But uh, yeah, I think we have to be very alert to the fact that in the name of public safety, you know, not more forms of violence is done. To, to our bodies in the name of experimentation, particularly when you know, the, the exact the understanding of what this experimentation is really about, you know, what are its consequences on the long term. You know, all too often the medical system says, oh, don't worry, it's perfectly safe. And then we discover that no, it's not so. Mm -hmm. Women were sold hormones after menstruation, after menopause. And they were told, oh, these hormones, they give you back your energy, your creativity, your sexuality, are perfectly safe. I've heard that said to me many times. And, uh, but we know that many of the women who took them, their daughters have developed incredible cancers. Is there 100% proof? Maybe not. But nevertheless, those connections are there. You know, there is a strong suspicion that those hormones were actually the pill, you know, et cetera. So we have to be very vigilant. And, uh, and this is where, this is where, you know, going back to the point, the connection between women in the so-called community with women working in the institution. The connection with the nurses, we need to talk to the nurses, we need to organize with them, support them and talk together with the teachers, with the, with the you know, um, people, women as well as men working inside, you know, so that not only they cannot divide us and force a, a sort of hostility, mm -hmm. but also because we learn, because we have the same interests. Yeah, more questions? Sylvia, are you okay to take three I'm last fine. questions? I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm absolutely fine. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No Wonderful, problem. because yeah. they're coming from different directions, which is yeah. great. There's some really good questions, and I think you've answered some on pharmacology and big yeah. pharma. Um, there's a question that is, I think, probably for everybody, which is where can we have this mass discussion that you mentioned that's from tony mm, yeah then uh, a question on the police and uh -huh. that's hashim hashim how do you read the role of working class police in crushing movements around the world should they be engaged or confronted what is your position on revolutionary violence and then there was another question that I've now lost, but it was good. It was about uh, the reclamation of the land that had been enclosed and how to kind of re, um, re-nature the, the soil that's been abused and the climate that's been abused. And I know we've seen in Detroit, for instance, people yeah. reclaiming, reclaiming their land. Um, do you have any hope in that? Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, OK, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the, the question on the police. Uh, can, can you repeat the question? On yeah, the it was. It's exactly how do you read the role of working class in bracket police in crushing movements around the world uh -huh. based on the 60s and 70s experiences? Okay. Should be should they be engaged or confronted? So what's your position on revolutionary violence? Uh -huh. 
Okay, so yeah, the, the, the question where we can have a discussion. I think that's a very good question. That's a very important, that's a big issue because um, we have seen that the spaces for this kind of discussion, you know, have been shrunken and shrunken and shrunken. And of course, with COVID, this discussion has been made more difficult because of the social distances. Fortunately, we are moving towards the spring and summer. So we now have a good moment because uh, we can actually meet in the open. But this does not solve the problem of space, political spaces. And it's not just a physical question, it's a political question, right? How to organize spaces in any community where people can come together, right? And uh, this, I think, it's really a central issue of the organizing. I mean, uh, in the United States, you have the old tradition of the town hall. The town hall is, you know, this big building where once in a while a politician arrives and tells you, oh, we are going to build the throughway, or we are going to have this and this happening. And uh, they want to see what people are thinking. And usually it's a kind of top down, you know, although sometimes it gets very lively. We need spaces where people can come together. In, okay, in the US, one development over the last three, four years has been assemblies. Yeah. Now, many of those assemblies take place by Zoom, but soon, some of them have continued to take place also in person, right? This is the Argentinian model, is the Latin American model, is the La Asamblea Barriale, huh? is the fact that people come together. The issue is collective decision making, right? It doesn't mean it's perfect democracy, right? But certainly means that you begin to have people coming together and bringing together problems, bringing together issues. So I would say, yeah, big important question, right? And, uh, you know, this, this form of the assembly. By the way, the book I mentioned by Veronica Gago, Feminism International, has a whole section on the question of assemblies. So the question of working class policing. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, all I can understand, and perhaps the person who raised the question can tell me if I am correct, is that, uh, you know, there's been a very, you know, among workers, working class workers, particularly white workers, you know, many have had a policing effect. On, on other workers, right? And, uh, you know, and uh, this whole issue of, of the police is, uh, is terrible. You know, um, in the United States, there's been a huge discussion. You know, the police system in the United States goes back to slavery. You know, cops, the police system was born out of the need to catch fugitive slaves. This is the history of the police. This is the birthplace of the police. It's really connected, genetically connected with the history of slavery. Now, the fact that, you know, in, in the history of labor struggle, you have part of the working class who sides with the capitalists, who become the goons, right? That's terrible. Mm? I mean, you know, uh, who was the famous uh, American tycoon who said, I hire half of the working class to police the other half. I imagine that the question is about this, right? Uh, you know, th this, this division is obviously a very, very important. I mean, capitalism has ruled through these hierarchies, has ruled by hiring people, the informant, 
the, the, the ones who are the supervisors. You know, many cops themselves come from the proletariat. And this is a major issue. And I don't know what the answer is, you know, except to, you know, create, expand to, to make it, to make it, to make it worthwhile to work in a logic of solidarity rather than in a logic of uh, complicity with those who are exploiting, you know, your own community. Um, the question of the Russian device, I don't know what that really is, like everything, well, what, what does that mean and what, you know, we have a whole discussion about what violence is about, first of all, right? And, and uh, you know, um, as a demonstration, a revolutionary violence is saying no, it's a strike, what it is, uh, you know? So I think we have to be far more specific to have that discussion. And uh, reclaiming the landing clause, there is a tremendous amount of reclamation. You go from Brazil, the landless movement people, yeah, the movement of the landless in Brazil, you know, who have reclaimed millions of hectares of land, much of it organized now, cultivated communally. It's one of the most impressive movements today on, on, the, on, on the planet. Right? They have, uh, you know, battled the appropriated land and on that land, they have reconstituted new forms of collective production. And for example, now in at least eight or nine Brazilian cities, you also have shops that are selling the product, you know, of the agricultural work that is done on that reclaimed land. And of course, it's sold at very different prices, it's sold to communities, and um, it's, it's very, very... On the, on the, on the connected with that, you have the day-to-day -day reclamation across the world, in Africa, in, in urban area, and urban farming, has been a phenomenon that has grown with hand in hand with the process of land privatization and land dispossession. Land dispossession, people kicked off the land, kicked off, pushed off the rural area, they go into town, forced to urbanize. The first thing they do, they take over whatever land is not publicly used. Public land not used. I've seen images of places in Thailand, in the Philippines, where women were growing crops, even on the slopes, you know, of the trains, <laughs> train tracks. Mm. Uh, I've seen universities in Africa where patches of land were taken over by local farmers. In the city itself, urban farming, you know, the idea of the urban garden, you know, comes from this process. You know, the response to enclosure, the response to companies going away and, you know, World Bank Agricultural Development Project, this massive dispossession. Then people go to town and they found a spot of land and they plant peppers, they plant tomatoes, they plant something. And a lot of those people are actually women who are used to have a piece of land for the pot, right? Agriculture for the pot, for the kitchen, for the consumption of your family, not to sell, but for the consumption. Mm. So that reclamation is very, very important is very, very important and, uh, you know, has to be amplified at all level, also urban spaces. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think, Fran, I think I, I, I feel we have some more question. I can also just you know, stay on for some more questions. That's fine. Yeah, that's you're okay. wonderful. You're wonderful. It's like I feel we haven't exhausted I, you. At I'm, all. Learning. I'm learning what, what's in people's <laughs> mind. You know, it's very important yeah. for me also to hear, particularly younger people. I'm yeah. 79 today. And yes, uh, <laughs> we were going to sing <laughs> happy birthday to <laughs> you. So <laughs> but uh, I you say are. because I know that I appreciate, you know, there's an old issue that comes also with age. Because many times I know that there are certain things that I can say. And particularly when it comes to transmitting what I've learned. And what I understand on the basis of what I learned. But I know that there are things that only when you're young and you have a whole life ahead of you, you can see. Yes. I, I understand it very, very well that I've um, part of the process of my thinking is learning my limits. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know, what is that I should talk about and what is that I shouldn't talk about? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and listening to what really matters now, but yeah. I, th I think you are. I mean, I, I, I just think you have the most phenomenal range over geography and history. It, mm -hmm. It's quite exceptional. And to combine that with an activist uh, front as well it is phenomenal and it's so good to see because you know if people go into your archive they will see so much work on so many different topics uh, we haven't even touched really on Nigeria on Africa on the enclosures uh, you know of African land where there's what four percent left for Africans mm. so it, it's really important to, to see that breadth and that depth which is I think quite exceptional so we'd like to sing you happy birthday uh, <laughs> and, and the, the tragedy is that we wanted to have you here in person so that we could take you on a Caliban and the witch tour of Lancaster which yes. is really Central, you know, Lancaster Assizes was central in both the Atlantic oh. slave trade and the witch hunt. So, but the promise that Sylvia made earlier, actually, which is that she will visit us next year in the spring. Yes. And then, <laughs> and um, we'll come certainly in March. Oh, wonderful! March, That's so we'll good. definitely come to Europe for an yeah. event in the in an island at the north of Norway that was the site of near Finnmark, the town of Finnmark, it was a site of many, many trials. Many women were burned in the 16th, 17th century. And uh, the government of Norway has created a memorial. Two famous artists, one is Louise Bourgeois, I've created a big <laughs> memorial to the witches yeah. for the memory of these women. And Louise Bourgeois created a chair, very powerful, with a flame coming from mm -hmm. the, a hole. Yeah. And this is going to be the site of the launch of an encyclopedia on feminicide. And the first volume that I've contributed the introduction uh, will be on the witch hunts like past and present and so I'm due to come in March so I can also come to Lancaster. Yes you're so so welcome we will we will look after you and we will continue this conversation because it will be interesting to see what happens yeah. as the pandemic unfolds. Yeah. You know the the level of experimentation on population yeah. is very unusual. Yeah. And, and we are watching those twin as you summed up beautifully in your lecture, those twin impulses of, of, you know, capitalism making such an opportunity of this crisis, but of people fighting back and finding new ways, Absolutely. new solidarity. Yeah. So Absolutely. that was wonderful. Fran, should we sing? Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, well, I mean, well, we can definitely wish happy birthday to Sylvia. And, and I think we're talking for all the 600 people that were following and to thank you for being with us on the day of your birthday. Uh, there's, there's a thing you said that I'd like to highlight because you said at some point we need each other and those who know you a bit there's always a lot of joy in 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 the way you look at the world and it also came through in that beautiful interview on the new york time magazine mm -hmm. and so i think that sense of uh, solidarity and joy and even a bit of poetry in the midst of devastation yeah, is something so we can take away with us tonight absolutely we need joy you know, we need joy. I've been uh, very inspired. There is a, a, a organization of domestic workers in Spain, in Madrid, Territorio Domestico Attivo, mostly migrant women. And one of the first things that they decided when they began to organize is that part of the time they came together would be to sing and to dance. They would have to set aside always because they recognize that this meeting, this political organizing, where there is only, oh, well, you know, absorbing all the pain and then the work and then and not having a moment of pleasure, of joy, being together, getting to know each other, moving to another dimension. And they decided, no, 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 no. And so they started making songs. They started also doing some dancing. And uh, we, one of them came to talk in New York. And then at the end she said, no, no, we have to sing. And we have to dance a little bit before we end because this is the way in which we will want to go to meetings. Exactly. We will want to go to meetings instead of saying, oh, another meeting. Yeah. And cakes. Cakes, I think we should have cakes. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, the struggle has to have its own. This is something I've learned that I didn't know, you know, I didn't think when I was very young. You know, the struggle itself needs its own forms of reproduction. Yeah. Because it needs its own forms of reproduction. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to think of reproduction in that way too. Wonderful. <laughs> So, so happy birthday to you. you. Thank happy you birthday, so dear Sylvia. Thank happy you birthday. If people have you. any other, you know, pressing question, I'll be happy to, to continue. I think we are, let me see. Uh, I think we're almost ready to let you go, but there's uh, lots of comments coming in as to really how grateful everyone yeah. is. I think uh, it's it's not easy to uh, to give you a sense of how much admiration there is around our department, you. our students for you and affection, I would say. So th there was a lot of excitement about this talk and the very fact that you might actually come next year in person would be just yeah. fantastic for all of us and to talk with you in Lancaster about witch hunting, which is the yeah. right place for us to do. And we can you. take a walk to Pendle together. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> very good, thank you. We, we should also, we should also say that um, Islam Al Khatib has actually transcribed and translated this talk into Arabic ah. and is going to put it on Wiki Gender uh, ah. and would like to start a conversation around it. That's quite wonderful, isn't it? Really, yeah, really good. Beautiful. That's very beautiful. Yeah. I'm really happy um, about um, it. We will be uploading it to the Lancaster Sociology YouTube site. Uh, all attendees will be given a link. Um, and there is also coverage, uh, I think, on Twitter. So there's, there's a lot happening. But we'll yeah, keep, thank you. Keep thank you so forward. much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for coming yeah. on the day of your birthday. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. A good talk. It's a good way to celebrate it. It's a good way to celebrate it. We're delighted. Yeah.
And all the best. Thank you. And to our meeting in person in a few months. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Take care and have a nice, have a really, really nice day. I will, I will. <laughs> all around me, actually, Brooklyn is exploding. The spring has finally come. Oh, it's beautiful. And all the trees now are putting out their first leaves, so it's quite magical. Oh, we'll go and have a lovely walk, a glass of champagne yeah. and a nice piece of cake. I will. Very <laughs> <good>. <laughs> uh, stay well, eh? All the rest. Bear <gasps> and Francesca, stay well. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Oh, thank you, too. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.